Hello, and welcome to my YouTube channel called Statistics from A to Z, Confusing Concepts Clarified. These videos are based on content from my book of the same name, which is published by Wiley. For more information on the book and these videos, please visit statisticsfromatoz.com. This video is the first in a playlist on variation in populations. The playlist is also planned to include individual videos on sums of squares, variance, standard deviation, and standard error. See statisticsfromatoz.com slash videos for the latest status of my videos completed and planned. The scope of the book, like most introductory books, includes first and second semester college statistics. That is about the statistics and populations and samples. But unlike most other books, my book also includes the statistics in black belt level for Six Sigma. Six Sigma is a robust and rigorous process control and improvement discipline. So I will also do some videos on variation in processes. Measuring and controlling variation in processes is a big part of Six Sigma. The videos on variation and processes will include statistical process control, control charts parts 1 and 2, and process capability analysis. As usual in the book and in these videos, we'll go quickly through a list of keys to understanding, or KTUs, to give you the overall picture on one page. And then we'll go into detailed explanations of each of the keys. For this video, there are three keys to understanding. The first KTU tells us that variation, which is also known as variability, dispersion, and spread, is one of three major categories of measures for describing a distribution or data set. The second KTU states, there are a number of different measures of variation, each with its pros and cons. The third and final key says, some distributions are often succinctly described by stating the mean for central tendency and the standard deviation for variation. And here on one page are the three keys to understanding the concept of variation. You may wish to pause the video and read them all together. Let's go back to the first KTU. One of the reasons that statistics is so confusing to most people is that it will use two or more different terms to mean the same thing. The concept of variation is also known as variability or dispersion or spread. Sometime after I learned that these four terms were basically synonyms, I was watching a video in which a professor kept saying scatter. For a while I had no idea what he meant, but eventually I figured out that he was talking about variation. Key to understanding number one tells us that Variation, which is also known as variability, dispersion, and spread, is one of three major categories of measures for describing a distribution or data set. These categories are central tendency, which is also known as center, shape, and variation. There are different measures under each of these three categories. To describe the center of a distribution, we could provide a number for the mean, or for the mode, or for the median. For shape, the number for skew will tell us the direction toward which the long tail is skewed and how prominent is this distortion. And kurtosis is a measure of how pointy a distribution is. Variation has more measures than the others, including the, ranges, the, the measures for range, variance, standard deviation, and others which we'll soon describe. Conceptually, measures of variation tell us how spread out the data is. The more spread out, the higher the numerical value for the measure of variation. There are a number of measures of variation. Different measures are useful for different purposes. Here are five common measures. Range, interquartile range, or IQR, variance, mean absolute deviation, MAD, and standard deviation. We'll describe each one in turn. 
range is simply the difference between the highest and lowest values. It only tells you about two values out of the many which may be in the population or sample. It tells you nothing of the values in between the highest and lowest values, so it doesn't give you any information about how data is clustered about the mean. The value of the range is in the same units as the data. It can be useful in a description, but it is not commonly used in statistical calculations. The interquartile range, or IQR, is illustrated as the box in this box and whiskers chart towards the bottom of the page. Everything else in the chart is outside the IQR. The box tells us where the middle 50% of the data are clustered. We see from the scale at the bottom of this slide that the IQR box in this example extends between the data values of 30 and 50 centimeters. So the interquartile range is 50 minus 30, which equals 20. 25% of the data points have values less than the lower boundary of the box, and 25% of the data values have values greater than the upper boundary of the box. So the box defines what is sometimes called the middle 50. The lowest and highest data values in the data set are outside the IQR box to the left or right. So the interquartile range itself tells us nothing, nothing about them. The IQR is helpful in describing the clustering around the mean, and it is in units of the data. Like the range, the IQR is useful for descriptive purposes, but unlike, say, the variance and the standard deviation, it is not commonly used in statistical calculations. There will be a there will be a separate video on the concept of variance, so we won't go into a lot of detail here. Conceptually, the variance is the average of the square of the difference of each data value from the mean. The squaring of the differences gives this disproportionate weight to very high or very low values. Here is the formula for calculating the variance for a population. The symbol for population variance is the Greek letter sigma squared. The numerator is the sum of squares, and the denominator is capital N, the size of the population, if it is known. There are different formulas for the variance of a sample and the variance of random variables. Unlike the range in the IQR, the variance is used a lot within statistical calculations. More on that in the video on variance. However, as a final measure of variation, it has another drawback. Its units are the squares of the units of the data. So you could have a variance calculated to be in square liters or squared seconds, which of course are meaningless terms. In calculating the variance, why did we square each difference before summing them? Because if we didn't, we'd end up with zero every time. So why not use the absolute value instead of squaring? That way we would avoid the disproportionate effect of squaring very high and very low data values. And, and this is what the mean absolute deviation, the MAD, does. But the MAD is not used that much because squares are easier to manip manipulate in mathematical calculations than absolute values. This is explained in the video on the variance. Also, we can just take the square root of the variance to get the standard deviation. The standard deviation is the square root of the variance. Compared to the variance, it can greatly reduce the disproportionate effect of high and low values. But extremely high or low values can still have outsized effects. The standard deviation does have the benefit of identifying cluster about, clustering about the mean, like the variance does, but it is in units of the data, which is most more, much more useful than the squared units that the variance gives us. There will be a separate video on standard deviation. And here, once again, on one page is a summary of these five measures of variation. Key to understanding number three. Some types of distributions, <clears throat> excuse me, like the normal and the T, are often succinctly described 
by stating the numerical value for the mean to describe their central tendency and the numerical value of the standard deviation to, to describe their variation. On YouTube, I have a lengthy playlist of videos on distributions. Sum of squares is another concept involved in variation. There will be a separate video on the concept of sum of squares, but briefly, sum of squares is short for sum of squared deviations. A deviation is a difference from a single data value to a specified value. A specified value might be the mean or a point on a regression line. Each individual deviation is squared to eliminate the negative numbers, for example, x minus x bar squared. Then all are totaled to give the sum of the squared deviations, also known as the sum of squares, SS. Earlier we showed this formula for variance. The numer numerator on the right side of the equation is the sum of squares. Now there are different types of, sum of, sum of squares, sums of squares. ANOVA and regression each use several different types of sums of squares. We've been talking about variation in populations from which we can capture data. Unlike most books on statistics, my book also covers analysis of the statistics gathered from processes. These can be used in process improvement methodologies like Six Sigma. Variation is the enemy in managing processes because we want our processes to run consistently. Now, variation in a process can be either common cause variation or special cause variation. Common cause variation is within control limits and it's to be expected, like random noise within the process. Special cause variation is not expected. It can come from unknown cause, causes outside the process. How to identify each type of variation, uh, one from the other, will be covered in future videos I plan to do on control charts, statistical process control, and process capability analysis. Okay, that concludes our clarification of the concept of variation, variability, dispersion, and spread. If you like this video, please remember to press the thumbs up like button on your screen below. I'll also be making more videos of some or most of the 60 plus concepts in the book if folks like you tell me more videos are wanted. Please subscribe to this channel to be notified when new videos are uploaded. Also, the website statisticsmadez.com has a listing of available and planned videos. Now, videos like this one can be very helpful, but they're not very handy when you want to quickly look up something on the job while studying or during an open book exam. For that, nothing beats a book or an ebook. You can learn more about those on the website. I'd recommend following my blog at statisticsfromazcom slash blog. I've got some things there that hopefully you will find interesting, like a statistics tip of the week series, as well as posts showing that you are not alone if you're confused by statistics. I'll also be posting on the Facebook page, Statistics from A to Z, and on Twitter as at Stats A to Z.